It's time to go beyond the headlines Cause I don't put in overtime just so I can headline Okay, now it's Fox Sports, I'm live with Renee Going hard every day, sports rapping every play Different segments for your favorites Coming at you daily with positive vibes Yeah, we some game changers Basketball, football, soccer With different interviews, you never know who may pop up Listen, <laughs> only on Beyond the Headlines This is Beyond the Headlines <laughs> Only on Beyond the Headlines, this is Beyond the Headlines. <laughs> Only on Beyond the Headlines, this is Beyond the Headlines. With Renee Washington. Welcome back to Beyond the Headlines with Renee Washington. We could not have timed this interview any better because joining me this week, we've got Evan Barnes, Memphis Grizzlies beat reporter and also covers the Memphis Tigers. Evan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Renee. I appreciate being here. How are you doing? I'm good. I have a little cold, but other than that, I cannot complain. I am <laughs> thrilled to have you on the show because anybody that has been following the NBA, along with all the trade news that we've been hearing, you have been hearing the Andre Iguodala, John Morant, Steph Curry, all the, the buzz that's going on around the Grizzlies right now. So, Evan, take us through what you've been seeing behind the scenes. We saw Andre Iguodala. Actually, let me even backtrack. Andre Iguodala, since being traded to the Memphis Grizzlies, has yet to play with the Grizzlies. He's been on a seven-month, incredibly well-funded vacation. And I love it, the fact that he's literally finessing the system. He's getting, he was getting paid millions. He wasn't playing. And he, t- he openly was voicing that he was not playing. And as of recent, came out and even said in an interview about how, you know, he was there more to mentor the younger guys and wanted to play with a team that had a better chance of the playoffs. Yikes. So what have you been seeing in Memphis on your end from the behind the scenes? Well, it's definitely been a, uh, a passionate week, we'll say. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you talk to Memphis fans, Memphis fans are incredibly upset. They would rather him. Um, they would – they. They were, they're very angry at him. He is going to be booed the next time he comes to Memphis just because, obviously, the fans here are very upset with how things went down. Um, for me, I, you know, when we talked to the Grizzlies this past week about it, I think we were surprised that Dylan Brooks was the first one who opened his mouth and said, yeah, you know, I can't wait to play him um, on, on, on his new team so we can show him what Memphis is really about. And I think that – so just to clarify that, Dylan Brooks is very – outspoken very comfortable with what he says he's a competitor um he probably was just like hey if he didn't want to be here that's cool when we play him again hopefully we'll get to show him kind of what he was missing out on so I don't think he meant it with any malice but he clearly meant it in a way that was a well if he doesn't want to be here we respect him and obviously everyone in the locker room to a man said that they respected his decision but some of the younger players took it a little personal and they're probably just speaking up in sense of hey if he didn't want to be here, we understand that. But let's, you know, play him and let's show him, you know, what he missed out on. So we were surprised that Dylan Brooks said I was standing right next to him. And then John Morant obviously took it a step further going to yeah. Twitter and getting back and forth with Steph Curry on it. And, uh, you know, Ja told us at Shoot Around Wednesday that he and Steph Curry exchanged DMs. They talked about it. There's all love. It's just a matter of, hey, two competitive dudes were like, hey, I'm not afraid of taking on the establishment because I want to show them that I'm here to win, too. And I can respect that. You want to see your young players kind of have that sense of, hey, let's go ahead and put our foot forward because what's the, what, what's the worst that can happen? It really was something that started, as you mentioned, with Brooks. It started very small. And his comment, as you said, could have been taken very innocently that, look, we're just excited to show what we're all about here in Memphis. But when John Morant tweeted and then Steph Curry tweeted back and and um, John Morant dropped the picture of Kevin Durant, and Steph Curry dropped the picture of Andre Iguodala with the trophy when they, back when he was with the Warriors and they won. Uh, it just it really spiraled into something that, as you mentioned, just caught the whole – a lot of NBA fans, especially Grizzly fans, I'm sure, by surprise because Morant was openly saying, you know, it's in the past now, but that he's excited to get Winslow, who will actually want to play with them in Memphis. So a lot of these words are innocent, but there's some jabs in there, and that's – that's something I, I actually was watching it unravel. And I was like, ooh, it's like you could see it heating up where it was very professional and how they were going about it. But the jabs are definitely there from the, the retweeting of Rachel Nichols to dropping pictures. It really was something else. But even more than that, what did, I mean, you've been working closely with the Grizzlies. What has Andre Iguodala really been like in that time that he was in Memphis? What, did you get the vibe that he felt 
he was too good to be there. I mean, he his comments about wanting to be with a team that has a better chance of, you know, winning and making the playoffs, it definitely is a is a backhanded uh, insult to the Grizzlies. So did you well, get that vibe from him prior to this week that he felt like he was above them and didn't want to be there? Well, well let's, let's just go back a little bit. So the team, before training camp opened, the team in Iguodala had an agreement to where he would right. not, you know, show up with the team. He would not have to report while they tried to te- why they tried to trade him. So to be honest, I don't think that there was any kind of you know problems. The, the team agreed to this arrangement. He didn't want to be in Memphis. I think both parties tried to do something that was going to fit, benefit both of them because at the time, nobody knew that this team was going to be where they are right now. They thought this mm-hmm. was going to be a rebuilding team with young pieces. Nobody knew that John Morant was going to be this highlight superstar in the making. Nobody knew the Grizzlies would be in the eighth seed right now. And really, if we can be frank about this, you can't blame Iguodala, who spent five years, the last five years, in the NBA Finals. You really can't blame him being like, hey, I've enjoyed the good life. I want to take control of my career before it ends. He's played 15 years already. I want to be the guy who takes control of my career, decides where I want to go, pulling rank, which is what most veterans do, by the way, and deciding, hey, I want to go somewhere where I think I can keep winning. And I feel that as a veteran who played those years in Philly, got to taste the good life with the Warriors, he had the right to do that. Now, of course, that might not have set well with the Grizzlies, who, of course, wanted him to, you know, be that mentor, who would have embraced him being that role. But in the same way, it's worked out because the Grizzlies had that mentor with, you know, Jay Crowder and Solomon Hill before they were traded. They've been able to kind of rally around, hey, we're this young group that's having fun. They're really tightening it together. And it's benefited really both. Now, again, you can say, well, Iguodala – shouldn't have gone on ESPN talking about his situation. But in reality, he's got nothing else to do. Like, he didn't say anything inflammatory. He didn't say anything bad about, you know, the Grizzlies better deal me to where I want to go until we heard those reports through his people that, you know, or through sources, I should say, um, that he wanted to go where he was going to go. Otherwise, he's going to set up the season. He was controlling his career. And I don't see any problem with that because as a veteran, and to be blunt, I'm the same age as Iguodala. I understand this. As a mm-hmm. veteran, you want to have that control over your career because you've been dictating where you're going to go the rest of your, you know, your whole career. Iguodala has made the most money in his career at the back end of his career, and it worked out for him because now he has a, he's going to sign a two million two year extension or thirty mil. You know, like you said, he finessed this, and you can't blame him for that. And it wasn't like Memphis was going to be like, you know, he's laughing in Memphis's face. It's like, well. Look at the bright side. You have a team right now that doesn't need him and is poised to be good for the next few years. So I think it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point in the fact that at 36 years old <clears throat> and having been in the last five championships, yeah, he has a right to, to say where he wants to go. And I think this issue in itself is actually a, a small step or piece of the bigger picture that we're seeing in the NBA that other professional leagues are trying to get to where the players do have a voice. Andre Iguodala literally said he's a player and openly agreed to, you're going to, part of this trade means I'm not actually going to play with you guys. And that was the agreement from the beginning. So when this came out, I think a lot of people didn't even know about the agreement prior to this. And so, yeah, it took them by surprise. But in reality, as you mentioned, there's no, this is nothing new. We knew that he never wanted to be there. This was a temporary, a temporary move for, you know, a a next step for both teams, for both Andre Godala and the Memphis Grizzlies. So with Memphis picking up Justice Winslow as Andre Godala goes to Miami, what do you think he brings to the Grizzlies? As you mentioned, with having John Morant, who is stepped into the league, surprised so many of us because, yes, we knew he was talented, but we did not expect this much so soon. What now do you see from the Grizzlies moving forward as they are a team that, as they said to Andre Godala, you got to watch out for. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and so uh i obviously think justice winslow obviously you know from from obviously those of us who saw him at duke a few years ago he obviously has a great reputation he's been with the heat he obviously is familiar to memphis fans because the first game of this season i believe he had 27 8 and 8 i'm thinking or close to those numbers but he had a really good game but the problem is that he's been hurt most of the year i think since december 4th he's only played in one game so the question is when will he be healthy because he was supposed to miss this heat, this heat road trip while he recovers from a bone bruise in his back. Um, but from what the Grizzlies have, you know, have shown by making this trade, they're not concerned with that long term because 
They believe he can get healthy. They've invested in their medical staff. Um, they believe he will be fine long term. And you look at where, what he brings to the table. He's somebody who can get to the basket. He's another solid wing player. He can defend pretty well. Um, he's also 23 years old, so he's going to fit in with this young group. He knows Tyus Jones going back to their Duke days. So really, it's a matter of addition. You know, you get rid of Iguodala. Okay, cool. You bring in this promising young player who could be an impact guy once he gets healthy. And even next year, when he's fully healthy, he could be even a better fit on this team. So I think it's a really good move for the Grizzlies, where if you look at just those two guys, the Grizzlies definitely got a younger player who fits in with what they're trying to do. And once Winslow gets healthy, we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. His health is a big concern because obviously, not to be say the, the common sense response, but you can't do anything on the floor if you're constantly battling injuries and, you know, in and out, not able to get a rhythm going with the team. Well, we have seen, and as we knew, this time of year is always trade heavy. We have seen so many changes around the league. So I'm curious to know your thoughts on the winners and the losers of, of some of the trades. So just to, just to run off a couple of trades that we saw, obviously, we've been talking about Andre Godala moving to, to Miami and Winslow coming to Memphis. We also saw Andre Wiggins is going to the Warriors. D'Lo, D'Angelo Russell moving again, moving to Minnesota. Marcus Morris Sr. to the Clippers. We saw Andre Drummond to the Cavs. Robert Covington to the Rockets. I mean, it's been a lot of movement, and there's more beyond just the ones I named, of course. Um, but who do you think really won in all of this, all the trades and made a move that can, at this time of year, you feel like teams are, they've assessed their weak areas. They've assessed what they need to, to add. And now they're trying to make that push to, in the second half of the season, be able to be a playoff team. So who do you think won? And then we'll get to your losers after this. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll be honest. I've been so busy with you know the Grizzly stuff and that those that two day swing that I almost I almost didn't get to see as much. But I think um, the one one deal that I thought was in, really interesting was the Warriors getting Andrew Wiggins. I don't know if that was a win for them mm -hmm. long term, but I think you know obviously Wiggins has been an interesting player since he's been in the league. Um, he hasn't been as good as his number one overall draft pick status would you know suggest. But I think him going to the Warriors, he's got a chance where he can basically, you know, go there, hopefully salvage his reputation maybe, and then see what happens with, you know, either his offseason or if the Warriors decide to say, hey, we can bring you back off the bench when Steph and Clay get healthy. Um, so I think that was actually a good trade. It also unloaded D'Angelo Russell, who it seems like never was really a great fit with the Warriors. So now yeah. he gets to go play with his boy, Carl Anthony Towns, and with Minnesota. We'll see what happens there. So I think that one, I think the Warriors definitely, you know, got rid of one of their problems with uh, D'Angelo Russell. And um, I got to say, with the, the one trade I thought was really interesting was Houston getting Robert Covington. I mean, yeah. um, we, we already saw the, the dividends of that trade early when they beat the Lakers and Covington had those big threes in that game. But then also the Rockets went ahead and got blown out the next day with this small lineup. So uh, Houston got what they needed. They got the small – the lineup they wanted, they got a shooter in Covington. So I think we'll see what happens because obviously if they're going to go all in, you're going to need some shooters to keep things moving. So um, I think that's probably the two trades that stand out to me the most. I think we'll see what happens with the 76ers getting Alec Burks and Glenn Robinson. Um, I think Clint Capella going to the Hawks could help them next year because now they have another player with Trey Young who can kind of fit what his game, his skill set is. Um, so we'll see, but I think, you know, those are probably, again, the Warriors trade for, um, Andrew Wiggins and the, um, Robert Cummings and trade to Houston. I think those two kind of stand out to me a little bit now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that as you touched on with Clint Capella going to the Hawks, a big part of this that we're seeing is maybe some teams realize like the Hawks, ironically, actually, that this season they're not going to be a playoff team. And so now they're starting to rebuild for next season. You hate to even have that mindset that they're, they're, they're not tanking, but they're already moving forward to next season. But for someone that's rebuilding and you, you talk about um, on one side, we have the Rockets who are already in the playoff conversation, but for teams, even like Memphis that are younger and still have a lot of, of growing to do, why not make some moves now as, as you got into the, you know, into some games and halfway into the season to see what you can rebuild for next season. So, yeah, I, I agree. And I actually think this year, um, and it's probably because of, well, I'm going to assume it's because all of the changes we saw in the offseason, this was actually like a quieter trade 
deadline that we've been following because the movements haven't been anything of a big surprise. It's been stuff like Andre Drummond. We knew the Cavs were looking to pick someone up, especially when everything went down with Kevin Love and, and his openly uh, voicing that he's unhappy. But I, I don't really see any true winners or losers because I don't think any of these moves are really going to impact what we've seen so far. But I'm, are there any that really surprised you in a bad way? Like, what is the point of this trade? Why did you even do that? You know, maybe it's not even that there are losers with the trade, but it's more that it doesn't really make sense, as you mentioned with um, some of the, the moves that we've seen so far. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, honestly, like, the best way to assess these trades is let some time build and let's see what happens on the court. I mean, you know, you, it's really hard to determine, you know, if you've won a trade or not just on Absolutely. paper because when guys are on the court – then you can see kind of what happens. It's different than say like football or baseball where you can tell right away, Oh, they need this kind of player. Boom. They got this kind of player. Um, I, I think time will tell. And again, with, with draft picks that are involved, you really don't know how, how good a trade can be one way or the other. So mm-hmm. I, I think there's, you're right. I think there is time to kind of say, okay, yeah, you know, maybe I like those two moves I mentioned, but let's see kind of how it shakes out a little bit because um, there wasn't that big splashy, like, Oh my gosh, a contender got better with the Clippers getting Marcus Morris. Well, let's see what happens there because I, I saw the Grizzlies face Marcus Morris when he was on the Knicks and we saw that it, that ended up being like a nice little uh, skirmish, if you will. So I, I'm not really – like Marcus Morris is a good player, but is he a difference maker? I really don't know at this point. So I think there's time to see what happens. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, before we wrap up, I do want to quickly get into your thoughts on the All-Star game. As we're talking about all these trades and moves and, and um, trying to figure out how players are going to impact teams on paper, on paper, looking at Team Giannis and Team LeBron, holy smokes. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if maybe I'm just completely underestimating everyone that Giannis picked, or I don't know if Giannis is watching the same games and same players that we are. But is this looking as one-sided to you as it is to me with Team LeBron being completely dominant, having the two best Lakers, the two best Rockets, Kawhi Leonard, I mean, Luka Doncic, the, uh, the Joker, the, this, this <laughs> bottom, the quote-unquote <laughs> bottom five of the, of the team, in my opinion, would beat the top five of Team Giannis. I could be wrong. You know, it, it could shake out differently. But looking at – Joel Embiid, Pascal Siakam, Kemba Walker, Trey Young, and Giannis compared to everyone on Team LeBron, Damian Lillard, Chris Paul, there's not a weak person. Okay, it's the All-Star game. There's no weak player. But, (laughs) you know, this this is easily the top players in the league versus, like, the top 20 to 25-year-olds in the league. (laughs) That's the best – I think you put it the best way. It's like this is literally, like, for me, as an older older NBA fan – LeBron's roster looks like kind of, okay, yeah, you see why those guys are on there. Giannis's team is kind of like, oh, these are guys that you may have heard about or seen about, but you're not really sure. Um, obviously, Donovan Mitchell is a dude. Siakam, we saw what he did last year being the most improved player. But it definitely is going to be old school and new school kind of for the most part. Although, I'm really curious to kind of see uh, uh, this, the younger Sabonis. Like, I haven't really gotten to see much of him. Yeah. Like, I kind of want to see what he brings on the court because obviously if he's played this well, then – you know, let's see what he's got. Um, but I think it'll be a fun game. I mean, honestly, all-star games, you're not really looking at to see, like, which roster is is better because really it's a case of who's going to show out the most. It's not like where mm-hmm. you have the, the MLB all-star game where you can kind of tell, okay, which team has the better pitching and you can kind of play with that or which team's got the better hitting because there you go. It's basically saying it's like pickup ball. Hey, you get your five, I get my five, let's go and have fun. Yeah, so, honestly, that's that's exactly it. And I was looking at the uh, the draft, and I felt like Giannis was picking his friends. I mean, when I like he like the the indecisiveness on who to pick when you still have players like James Harden and Russell Westbrook that you could choose from. I'm like, <laughs> what? But I think I think you you hit it on the head. I mean, it is like an old school versus new school, and that's actually how I when I compare the two teams, that's literally what it looks like to me. The the rise, the true rising stars versus the old heads that have been here for a little longer. But do you also, what are your thoughts on the new format? I mean, I love that we're honoring Kobe, and I think that the All-Star game is definitely a great opportunity to do that um, and to honor his legacy. But do you think they almost went too far in trying the breakdown of, like, the, ga- the, the game now being smaller games and then the point different, the way you have to win? And 
I don't know your thoughts on if it, maybe someone overthought this instead of trying to find a, an easier, I don't even know if there's an easier I, way to honor Kobe. Yeah, I, I'll get to the Kobe part in one second. Like the whole thing of kind of the, the reset quarters and basically doing all this tweaking and stuff. I think to me, it's like, People are hearing how much, well, people don't care about the all-star game, don't play defense. I'm like, but you know what? People still watch. People still yeah, watch. We're not like, there it's not, to see defense. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like the all-star game has always been this, you know, pit, you know, bastion of, like, strong, hard play. It's, it's fun. Like, I remember, you know, the 98 all-star game when Kobe was flying around the court catching alley-oops all the time, and they were, he was going at Jordan or whatever, and that was fine. But, I mean, you know – what what are your favorite All Star memories? Like you remember players showing out. You remember guys having fun and doing different things. Like I don't necessarily think the All Star game needed to be tweaked to to please people who are like, ah, they don't play any defense. It's like I've watched All Star games on the high school level. I've seen stuff in college. A lot of guys don't play defense in these All Star yeah. games. You know, <laughs> so I I don't know. We'll we'll see how it looks. Like I think it'll be interesting to kind of see these first three quarters how it fares and how they you know keep track of all the scoring and whatnot but the fourth quarter where the Kobe tribute is going to be where they obviously will add 24 points to you know whichever team has the lead and then the first team to reach that target score um that is there wins the game um it's kind of like 20 it's kind of like going to 21 a little bit yeah I think yeah. it sounds like so I, I'm, I'm curious to see how that look you know how that goes because obviously you know you'll You'll see the guys, I guess, play harder if that's what you really want to see. I just want to see how it works out, like how the guys, you know, get creative with it, how they have fun. You know, are guys really going to try to, you know, help guys get those points? Or is it going to be a case of, well, hey, one guy takes over and it's like, I'm going to win MVP and go for this. Like, it, it could be really weird in a sense. But I, I, I kind of want to see how it looks before I pass too much judgment, even though I'm not, you know, I necessarily didn't think the game needed it, you know? I think that in a sense, and I completely agree with you, beyond just um, trying to, to find a way to, to, to leave a tribute or make a tribute to Kobe, just in general, I feel like everyone always overthinks the All-Star game because, as you mentioned, like if you want to watch defense, watch the other 86 regular season games and the playoff <laughs> games. Right, right. Like, we're not here. Right. We're not here to – you talk about defense. We're not here to watch defense. You know, we're here to see all of our favorite players play on the same court together like you do in 2K, but in real life, and watch them alley-oop and watch them dunk over each other and watch the Russell Westbrooks or whoever that you know from the beginning are going for MVP because they're literally not passing the ball to anyone. Like, I like that stuff. And it's, as you mentioned, it is just a fun game to watch. For us watching, for the for the players on the court, it's really just a chance to – have fun with your favorite – with the top players in the league. So, I don't know. We'll see what exactly. happens. Exactly. Let, let's, <laughs> let's enjoy this weekend. Like, All-Star Weekend is always a very fun weekend. As a, if you're a fan, if you're a media member, the games are – you know, the, the competition is great. You want to see who the young players are that are going to show out. I say just let's enjoy it for what it is and stop trying to, like, kowtow to the people who say, well, it needs to count more. It needs to be, you know, this and this. It's like, who cares what they think? Like, this game has been – what it is for years it's fun you get to see people enjoy it let's just have fun with it let's not try to over like you said let's not try to overthink this yeah and I agree it starts at the youth level any all-star game is never like this go hard moment of like showing all that you like you you're it's your chance to show off some of those dunks you've been practicing or just to again play with the the best players in your league it's not really about even who wins or loses, but it's not about defense and strategy. And no, we're overthinking things. But mm, Evan, thank you so much for joining the show. I've picked your brain enough between trades and the All-Star weekend. So where can our listeners follow you on social media to keep up with all your Tigers and Grizzlies coverage? For sure. Evan underscore B on Twitter. You can follow me there. Obviously, I don't just talk sports. I can talk about a lot of things. I love music. So come for the sports, stay for the music and funny observations. But Definitely, you know, stay tuned because we're going to have a lot to go on, obviously, with the Grizzlies fighting for a playoff spot, and uh, it should be fun. Yeah, I'm curious to see how um, the, the rest of the season looks for the Grizzlies and even the future beyond the season with John Morant, Justice Winslow, you know, these, these guys kind of being the, the face of the team. So it's an exciting time for you. But thank you so much for joining Beyond the Headlines with Renee Washington this week. It has been a pleasure having you on, and I hope to have you on again in the future. 
Thank you so much, Renee. You take care and thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs>